borders now are more secure than they have ever been in history. We strengthened security at the borders so that we could finally stem the tide of illegal immigrants. The borders are as porous as a sieve. What we're seeing is a kind of breakdown border. Tens of thousands streaming across the border from Central America. Our federal government has opened our borders and said, here we are, come on in. The actual number that is crossing is unknown. They're coming through us and they're coming to middle America. What is happening on the border of our country today is going to be the interior of the United States tomorrow. You've seen the news recently. There's chaos right now on our border with Mexico, especially in the Rio Grande Valley, the very southern tip of Texas. Tens of thousands of unaccompanied children and families traveling from Central American countries illegally crossing the border and surrendering themselves to our border patrol. They're held in overcrowded detention centers and then transported nationwide by our government, free of charge, to be reunited with relatives, many of whom are also illegal immigrants. Washington calls it a humanitarian crisis, but that's only a small part of what's going on, and most politicians refuse to tell us the whole story. That's where we come in. I'm Nick Searcy. The roles I play in movies and on television are fictional. Drama, mystery, action, suspense, but no script I've ever read comes close to the brutal reality of what's going on at our border with Mexico right now. The border is nearly 2,000 miles long and is the most frequently crossed international border in the world, with about 350 million legal crossings being made annually. Those aren't the ones that concern us. According to U.S. Border Patrol, last year more than 414,000 people, many from countries other than Mexico, were apprehended trying to illegally enter our country. In reality, that represents only a fraction of the number who actually made it through. The real number is unknown. Plus, in one six-year period, more than 17 million pounds of marijuana was seized. And since 1998, over 6,000 bodies of those who didn't make it across have been discovered. The images you've seen on the news are meant to divert attention away from the realities of our unsecured and unprotected border. We wanted to cut through the fog hanging over this problem. So we went to the border and we saw for ourselves. This isn't just about children, far from it. There is a border crisis and you need to know the truth about it. Our camera crew traveled with law enforcement officers, sheriffs, and border patrol agents from Texas to Arizona. These are the people you need to hear from. These are the guys in the trenches, the guys on the front line, the guys who deal with the problems every day and know how to solve them. Yeah. Who's gonna solve the crime along the border? Who's gonna solve the rapes along the border? Who's gonna go out there and pick up bodies from the lake when someone drowns trying to cross that river? U.S. government is not gonna do it. U.S. government already said that's a local responsibility. At the end of the day, the sheriff's office gets the first phone call. We're responding, no matter what. They don't call the FBI, they don't call the National Park Service, they call the sheriff's office. I am proud to be a law enforcement officer and have served my country and my county for 30 years. I have worked among great men and women who have done the same thing and had a real servant's heart to protect people in this country. We feel like we're doing our part on our southern border. We have limited resources and limited personnel. But we're not gonna put up any excuses. We're gonna get out here and we're gonna do what it is that we do. One driver, one possible I-8 passenger seat. As soon as we pulled him over, he popped up in the back seat. It looked like he wanted to run. Where's he claim he's from? We take 
our laws and the rights of our citizens very, very serious. There's a lot of good dedicated efforts at a local level and even the federal agents, Border Patrol and Customs, we have a good relationship with them. The issues doesn't lie here, it lies with the policymakers in Washington, D.C. You know, I've been watching a little bit on C-SPAN and a lot of them folks up there don't have a clue. And I just want to invite them to come to the border, travel all the border to get a true picture. People were getting kidnapped, taken back to Mexico. Home invasions, the burglaries, the extortions. And our government was not listening to us. We kept telling our government, we need some help, we need some help. Always, we'll see what we can do for you. We'll see what we can do for you. The size of our county, which is the eighth largest county in the state of Texas, is 2,300 square miles. And I have myself and six deputies. So our ranch lands, our outer areas away from town are wide open. No one's out there to see these people. One of my deputies has a vehicle stopped that has what we call one-on-one, -on -one, a U.S. citizen driver and an illegal alien in the, uh, in the vehicle that he's probably smuggling in the United States. All these county sheriff's departments are underfunded, they're undergunned. They are expected to help control the illegal aliens across the border. That is not supposed to be their job. They're supposed to be taking care of civil disputes, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, they are having to do the federal government's job that Washington, D.C. refuses to deal with. Washington has created a wide open border by refusing to enforce existing laws and by creating magnets that draw more illegal immigrants. Sheriffs and Border Patrol agents often have vast territories to cover. No one has anywhere near enough manpower to patrol it all, and the fence, the physical barrier into our country, in most places, it is little more than a joke. Some fences that are put up couldn't even keep a cow out. Other parts of the fence where it looks nice to the public, there's no one there watching it. We have a fence here that was put in, I want to say, seven, eight years ago. And it runs a length of about 2.8 miles or something like that. So people just walk around it. It turns into a barbed wire field fence, five foot tall. Border Patrol agents are stationed few and far between, often concentrated in bigger cities, hampered by a lack of resources and demoralized by directives from the administration that force them to break our laws, violate their oaths, and even prevent them from defending themselves when attacked. Instead of using resources to secure our border, Washington prefers to spend taxpayer money on a wide range of wasteful projects. Instead of upholding the Constitution and keeping America safe, programs such as the Popular Romance Project, hurricane emergency funds being spent on TV ads, grants to develop games based on the zombie apocalypse, and more, are routinely funded instead of directing the money where it's needed the most. Unfortunately, a lot of times we don't have the means, the manpower, the time to cover our entire area, especially with this mass influx of unaccompanied children or the women and children. It's diverting so much of our time and resources that we're not covering the areas that we traditionally cover. If you look at the numbers that I guess the service will tell you that we're looking at an 80 to 90 percent apprehension rate. In actuality, we're looking at a 30 percent apprehension rate. So 70 percent of what comes across that, that border gets away. So who's coming across that wide open border? The current surge of illegal immigrants includes many people officials refer to collectively as OTMs, or people who are other than Mexican. For those OTMs from Central American countries like Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, it can be a 1,700 mile journey to the U.S. border. A dangerous journey that can include a long train ride on what is called the beast then miles of walking through desert tundra, where they may face predators, both human and animal, where poisonous snakes and spiders are more plentiful than cactus. Sexual abuse, other physical abuse, and even death are real possibilities. 
With so many people surging across our border, and no border fence to speak of, and with holes in the fence we do have, you would think our elected officials would be concerned about our national security, right? Well, you'd be wrong. Instead of making it harder for people to enter secretly and illegally, our federal government is doing just the opposite. The Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, was a directive signed by President Obama on June 15, 2012, without approval from Congress. It grants legal protection to anyone who claims to have been brought to the U.S. illegally as a minor. One of the provisions in the program was that it only protected those not convicted of a crime, but we will soon see that the government has waived even this meager protection. DACA confers work permits, social security numbers, driver's licenses, documents allowing foreign travel, eligibility for some tax credits, affirmative action preferences, and more. In the two years since Obama authorized the deferrals, about 587,000 young immigrants have received protection under DACA. It is critical to understand that neither Congress nor the American people ever approved DACA. Since 2001, there was an attempt at an amnesty every single year. Congress has turned down the amnesty in one way or another every single year. President Obama has then said, well, since Congress won't do it, I will do it. The Constitution says Congress makes immigration law. This is frankly one of the most breathtaking power grabs by an executive, I think, that many people have seen in this century to just say, Congress didn't do what I wanted. In fact, they turned me down, therefore I'll do it on my own. Constitutional scholars from across the political and ideological spectrum agree that DACA has brought us to a constitutional tipping point and a separation of powers crisis. Even the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously ruled against President Obama's executive overreach. Unfortunately, none of this has slowed his unconstitutional actions. Yet another example of this lawlessness is the administration's effort to twist a 2008 anti-human trafficking law in order to allow the hundreds of thousands of children and teenagers who entered the U.S. illegally to jump the line and stay in America. It's called the William Wilberforce Act, and what it says is that young people under 18 who have no family members in the United States and who have been trafficked, in other words, essentially kidnapped and brought into the United States, that they can't just be sent back automatically. They have certain procedural protections and have to be able to see a judge, etc. So instead of being returned immediately, uh, this law is being interpreted require the Border Patrol officers to turn them over to the Health and Human Services officers who then look for somebody to take them. They're told to come back uh, to court at a given time and decide whether they should be deported or not. We're talking about people who are being put on buses, dropped off at stations, on commercial airliners, and we don't even know where they go to. You know, I'm really concerned that the processing is not being done. In one situation in San Diego recently, 40 names were called and none of them showed up. One of the reasons we're so concerned about moving these people across, around the country and relocating them, uh, they claim it's only for maybe 35 days or for a short period of time. But what has happened is, in effect, they are being given a temporary protected status. That means to us, they're here permanently. The political narrative of this administration is that they are refugees, and therefore, somehow or another, regular immigration law shouldn't be applied to them. The President of the United States has essentially sent out an advertisement that if you can get into America, you get to stay. And people certainly believe that they, once they come to the United States, they're going to get amnesty, they're going to get assistance, they're going to get an open arms reception. Once we apprehend somebody, once we arrest somebody, it's taken from our control. It's given to ICE and ultimately Health and Human Services and, and they just do whatever they're going to do and there's nothing we can do about it and it doesn't seem like they actually have a grasp on, on the severity of the situation. The border is more secure now than it has been uh, ever. We know that the terrorists who attacked us on 9-11 committed what's known as immigration fraud. The aliens who attacked us gamed the visa process, gamed the immigration benefits program. 
Mike Cutler is a former special agent with the Immigration and Naturalization Service and has been involved with immigration law enforcement for more than 30 years. The 9-11 Commission was very clear about how immigration played a pivotal role in the attacks. Once terrorists had entered the United States, their next challenge was to find a way to remain here. Their primary method was immigration fraud. Terrorists in the 1990s, as well as the September 11th hijackers, needed to find a way to stay in or embed themselves in the United States if their operational plans were to come to fruition. This could be accomplished legally by achieving temporary worker status. Look at the 9-11 Commission and what they said about immigration benefits, temporary work permission. That's what DACA is. So here we have a clear warning from the 9-11 Commission that was convened to find out what went wrong so it wouldn't happen again. And now there is a program in place that blithely ignores the failings that enable the terrorists to enter our country and attack us. If you want a criminal activity to stop, you impose penalties. Here we're providing every possible incentive. If people believe that there's an amnesty coming, it's gonna make people, one, more desperate to get here, and two, once they get here, more desperate to get away. We're seeing more assaults on our agents. We're seeing a lot more gunfire coming from the Mexican side. One fact that the politicians and news media aren't telling the American people is that illegal immigrants from more than 75 countries have also been identified, including Syria, Albania, Yemen, China, Egypt, Pakistan, Somalia, even people from nations currently suffering from the world's largest Ebola outbreak have been apprehended attempting to sneak across the wide open U.S. border. We're talking about people coming in who are under duress. They've traveled 1,700 miles. They're malnourished, they're dehydrated. They've been in conditions that breed infection. They're bringing over contagious diseases, which can affect everybody that they come in contact with. A large percentage of what is coming across is unknown. They're not all from Central America. They don't all speak Spanish. We don't know who they are, and we don't know where they're going. As of July 20th, 2014, 1,443 individuals from China were caught sneaking across the border. You have individuals that have been caught with tattoos on their, on their shoulders and their back who uh, are, are known to be soldiers for the Kaibilis, the Guatemalan Special Forces, Military Special Forces. You have individuals here that have ties to the Egypt, Egyptian government or Egyptian cartels. They're coming into the country. The drug cartels take advantage of presidential directives like DACA that invite people to illegally come across our border. The cartels are controlling who comes over the border and where they come across. There's nothing saying that these people coming across couldn't walk across the bridge. And it would probably be easier for them. They wouldn't have to go through the mess they go through. On top of that, it's not illegal to present yourself for asylum at a bridge as opposed to entering illegally into the country. These guys don't have a choice. The cartels tell them, you're going to cross here, you're going to cross this river, and this is just where you're going to do it, knowing that it's going to tie up the border patrol so we can't cover these areas where they're bringing drugs across simultaneously. These cartels are very complex. They're very deadly. Uh, they're very dangerous. We know that they live on the border. They have a product, and they'll do anything they can to get that product through. And once you get across that fence, it's wide open. There's really nothing random out here. What may appear to be a piece of trash left on the road, a discarded bottle, stacked rocks, a string tied to bushes, it serves as markers for smugglers, either as a trail or as a point of interest for something that they've put there. All the way around this one are carvings in this metal tank of people that have passed through here. We have a 13 right here, Trece, which is often associated with a street gang. All the way around the tank, they've marked their passage through this area. They're living in the communities, they're living in the nicer communities. 
and they are operating on our side of the on our side of the river. Most of them are trying to link up with our major highway system in the United States. Whether it be I-10, whether it be I-25 going north towards Denver, whether it's I-35 coming uh, north from Laredo into the central part of the United States, or whether it's I-40, you have access to the heartland of America. You have these, these cartel violent gang members, you hear about in Atlanta, Georgia. You hear about it in Ohio. You hear about the cartel members that are already in our country. Their intel is better than our intel. And I think they know when we're out here because we just haven't had those contacts. Where if you go south into the Boot Hill country, it's like the wild, wild west. We had 50 caliber rounds that were fired from the Mexican side into our side. This is a 50 caliber shell, and the bullet out the end is pretty substantial, if, if you see. So if somebody fires one of these, they don't mean for you to get near the river where they are. They would have no compassion. They don't care who they're messing with. It doesn't matter if you're Hispanic, if you're white, if you're whatever. It doesn't make any difference. If you take your money, they own you, and if you work for them, you do what they say, and if you don't, you're gone. It's bad enough that the cartels pose such a huge threat on the border and that people think they can get a free pass into the country at any time they want to. But as you've seen, what's even more troubling is the fact that our own government is making the problem worse. This, this area we're at right now is one of the, what the federal government calls a protected area. They open up the fence wide open during the, our rainy season. They're afraid that the water pressure will hurt, damage the fence. A few days after they opened it up, about a month ago, we had three truckloads come through full of marijuana. I think there's about 1,700 pounds of marijuana come through there. These are very vulnerable spots. This is a Mexican truck that backed up to these openings to smuggle bundles of marijuana through for mules. And then he got stuck trying to get out. The minute it rains, it's ollie ollie ox in free. Everybody load up in vehicles and head for the big cities because nobody's gonna stop you. Right behind me is a marker. It's an international marker. That separates the United States and Mexico right there. Just past that marker is Mexico. And we've been here now for some time. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. As we can see, we've had nobody come to check, see what they're doing. You can see the way up here, nothing has, nothing has happened. You know, it's the open border. We're trying to secure this border, and at the same time, they're cutting the agent's hours. If you're creating gaps in our coverage, obviously that's when people are gonna cross because they know when we're coming on, they know when we're, we're going, going home. Who is the real problem? Is it the person that's bringing the drugs across the border, or is it the administration that's helping them do it? It puts the local people in a very bad position. I've been dealing with this for 24 years. Because of lack of border security, 50% of my time on this ranch is spent fixing things or checking to make sure everything is okay. As far as you can see, we're looking at Mexico. We don't have anything delineating our border between the two countries. People can bring anything any numbers of people carrying anything they want across right here. There's absolutely no barrier at all. Our border's on fire and Washington is just sending us gasoline. The story is the same from Texas to California. Pick any county that's right on the border or even close to it. Money spent elsewhere on frivolous government projects is money not spent trying to keep the border safe and secure. The bottom line is that without manpower and resources, law enforcement officials need help. Brooks County is 70 miles north of the Rio Grande River. It's home to the Texas Border Patrol Station near Falfurious, located on U.S. Highway 281, one of the main corridors in South Texas used by illegal immigrants and narcotic smugglers. This is Falfurious Checkpoint. This checkpoint is one county in from the border. This is the number one checkpoint in the nation for uh, illegal alien apprehension, drug confiscation, and right now, 82% of the traffic they catch are OTMs other than Mexican. 
It's probably the busiest in the Southwest Corridor, for sure. And probably in the top 10 in the country as far as uh, vehicles with narcotics or vehicles coming up with, with undocumented persons. Not only do you have people trying to circumvent a checkpoint, but you, you also have your, your drug smugglers doing the same thing. This is the last checkpoint from the Rio Grande Valley North. If you get past this checkpoint, you're on your way to Houston and then to everywhere USA. To avoid detection and apprehension, the smugglers will drop off their human cargo south of the checkpoint on 281. Then they'll lead their groups around the checkpoint on a treacherous journey over private property comprised of heavy brush and soft sand. When they reach their pickup point, they change clothes and reunite with their drivers to ride north. When they get north of the checkpoint, about this area is where they get back on the highway and get picked up. And they have to get through private property fences like this one. They can climb over or they can crawl under. We're in the drop-off zone right now. For the next 12 miles on this side of the highway and some, to some extent on the other side, the fences are completely destroyed. This is all private property. It's all a big ranch country. This guy fixed this fence two years ago, and within a week, it looked just like this. I mean, there's complete lawlessness going on out here on all this private property. People being murdered, a lot of rapes, houses being burned down, ranchers being run off their property. It's almost like living on the border. In fact, it's even worse. Brooks County is overwhelmed with illegal immigrants, and many residents have moved away. Fewer residents, and little to no backup from the federal government, means that basic services like law enforcement have even less funding, but are expected to do more. An exodus of residents and businesses lowers the tax revenue for safety services even more. We're definitely understaffed. We're, we're not at all close to being equipped. Uh, we definitely need boots on the ground. We definitely need better communications uh, and technology where we, we can go be more proactive in what we're doing. We're just reacting to the circumstance. Right now, the Sheriff's Department can afford to post only one deputy per shift to cover approximately 1,000 square miles of the county. Law enforcement officers from surrounding counties help by volunteering. Sometimes it's uh, overwhelming, all the stuff we have to do, but just our work, just the line of work we have to do. There's a little uh, campground where the illegals use after they circumvent the checkpoint. They usually hide here for a few hours, they eat, and they get dressed before they, they're picked up here behind. Uh, some of these water jugs, they weren't here last week. Some illegal immigrants don't make it to their pickup point to rendezvous with their smuggler. It's a long journey through the brush and rough terrain. In the last 68 months, 448 bodies have been recovered in Brooks County. Many more go undiscovered. Our vegetation is thick to where if you walk in within the vegetation, you're not going to really get any type of breeze. You're not going to get air. You're going to feel suffocated. A few turnarounds, you're not going to know where you're at. You're going to end up right back in the same place. If, if you don't know it, if you're not equipped to do it, you're going to have problems. We see the damage it does. We see what this weather can do to you. You think a sunburn on the beach is bad? You ought to see the bodies we pick up. Helping the, the coroner put a dead body in the bag, it's a... Uh experience. The smell stays behind you in the bend, back of your nose. The thing about the smell is it, it's, it's, you, you, don't, you don't get accustomed to it because it's always different. Be careful where you step as far as the location because when the body burst completely. I stepped on the oil and the oil stuck to the boots and penetrated and you, you, couldn't get a, you, can't, you can't get that smell out of the boots so I had to throw them away. 31 years old. A very good look, looking young lady in her picture. Not at all as to what she looked like when we recovered her. Her hands were still intact. She still had her, her, her wedding ring on. Brooks County is wrestling with a very serious and dire situation. But 
local citizens are standing up to support local and federal law enforcement to stem the tide of illegal immigrants. Moving forward, uh, that we, we realized we had to do something. What we decided to do was start our own group called the Texas Border Volunteers. We aligned ourselves with law enforcement. We've been well received by law enforcement, Texas Rangers, DPS, Border Patrol. We're here on private property. We're not out there in public property. We don't make arrests, we don't touch them. All we do is watch them move on private property and report them as criminal trespassers to Border Patrol. For the longest time, they've been seeing people come across their land. And, and I know the Vickers, they're, they're very good people. Their heart is in the right place. Um, they're just trying to do what they can to, to help secure the, the area. What we see really are the criminal element that come through here. And so that's why it's so important that we are uh, helpful eyes for Border Patrol. And that's what we try to do. The Texas Border Volunteers are successful at observing and notifying Border Patrol about illegal immigrants. This is a, a trail that uh, many of the uh, illegals use. Here's a part of a track, a shoe print there. Last night our people spotted uh, 13 illegal aliens coming up this road. And uh, when they got here, they got a little too close, our people for their own safety, lit them up, and when they turned the light on, they ran. Seven of those were captured by Border Patrol, and then uh, this morning uh, we found out that they had captured an additional five, so meaning that uh, 12 out of 13 were captured. Those that are looking for jobs are giving themselves up as they cross the border. Uh, the, the ones that are coming on up here normally are those that have criminal records or they're what are known as SIAs or special interest aliens. Uh, special interest aliens come from countries known to sponsor terrorism. All of these people coming in here and we don't know who, why they're coming in here. I mean coming in here from all over the world. This is a, an emergency station. This is about a $60,000 investment by our federal government to uh, help these people that are uh, being smuggled through here if they get left behind or if they get sick they can come up and push this button the message is uh, given in uh, english spanish and in mandarin chinese last year during one of our border operations we identified a group of 10 coming out of a ranch on a no on a known trail as they went over the fence one of them uh, dropped this out of his pocket this is an Urdu English translation dictionary. Urdu is spoken in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. It's the national language of Pakistan. A lot of different phrases throughout this book uh, uh, circled and marked in no question. One of them was communicating with some people from the Middle East uh, and they got away. The drug and human smuggling in Brooks County is orchestrated by the Mexican cartels who exact a high price from their human cargo. Many of those people are, are really indentured servants. They're having to pay off that debt to the cartels for getting themselves being brought into the United States. And they may have to work 20, 30 years to pay off that debt. This is a whole underground profiteering in Houston area alone, we had 34 illegal brothels open up, and these are being worked by Asian women, Hispanic women. They will often ask, what city am I in? They don't even know where they are. They're really, they're really slaves. And somebody is making a lot of money off of these people, and uh, that's the humanitarian crisis. Let me tell you, there's a section of uh, ranch country that the cartels own on the U.S. side. And they don't own it by occupation, they own it by intimidation. The ranchers there will not call the Border Patrol or law enforcement when they see human smugglers with uh, leading groups of humans through their property. The cartels know where their wives shop and they know where their kids go to school. Some of their neighbors have called law enforcement and gotten a call later uh, in the day or maybe the next day. And that caller will say, if you call the Border Patrol again when you see people on your property, we're gonna come back and kill you. And so the cartels uh, control that property and it's moving north.
Those ranchers and citizens are our fellow Americans, afraid in their own homes. Imagine yourself in their shoes, waking up to threatening phone calls and worrying constantly about your family's safety. You think it can't happen to you? The violence and crime that's happening along the border is spreading all across the country. Violent crimes are no longer just a possibility. They're happening now. And with every new surge of illegal immigrants, the number of incidents is only going to increase. Karen Gonzalez is a Park Service employee, a longtime Arizona border resident, and a citizen just trying to make a living like everyone else. August 28, 2013, my son and I drove um, out to Chiricahua National Monument. He was working on the trails, and I, I was um, working in maintenance. I was cleaning the woman's bathroom. I remember bending down, cleaning the toilet, and I heard a noise like this. And I looked up, and I saw a man come rushing at me with a big rock. That's all I remember. She was left for dead. The suspect took her vehicle, drove to Douglas, Arizona, um, was brazen enough to even go through a fast food drive through uh, got some food, ate it, then walked up across the line to Mexico. And the only reason I survived it, I should say this, a woman I have not met yet saw the bathroom along the way, and she stopped. And she walked in and found me. And if she hadn't found me, I, I would have died. So I suffered a serious brain injury. Uh, but I got over it, you know, my balance is still very bad and this had been crushed, so I later had it surgically fused. It took us about four or five months, but through uh, some diligent efforts of some investigators and collaboration with our local and federal law enforcement, uh, we got a match, got identification on a suspect who, who now is in custody. He was a deported felon uh, illegally in this country when he did the act. Veteran Border Patrol agent Javier Vega was shot and killed in front of his family while they were fishing. His murderers were two illegal immigrants who had been arrested and even deported a combined total of six times. Our unprotected borders allowed them to return again and again. This illegal alien was fined $330 before it happened, you know, and, and there wasn't a problem until this point. And now, oh, okay, now we need to do something. Well, we should have cut this off before. The guy had weapons charges before. He had robbery charges before. These guys were, were criminals. They weren't just immigration criminals. These guys were, were criminals before this happened. And we let it go to a point where uh, ultimately one of our agents paid the ultimate price. Near Portland, Oregon, a 19-year-old woman ran over and killed two children and fled the scene. The woman has temporary permission to be in the country because of President Obama's DACA program deferred action for childhood arrivals. She was convicted of felony hit and run, but was not sentenced to jail and not deported, even though under the DACA guidelines, she should be deported now that she's been convicted. South Omaha, Nebraska. Louise Solowan was 93 years old. On July 20th, her daughter helped her into bed. By mid-morning on the 21st, she had been brutally beaten and raped by a 19-year-old illegal immigrant itinerant roofer. It was a 12 by 14 bedroom with 12 foot ceilings and there was blood splatter on all four walls and the ceiling and it was more than just one or two drops here. Uh, on the walls there was probably not a single square foot that didn't have at least a couple drops of blood in it. Uh, we learned later that he had beat her so bad that he shattered her right eye socket broke several teeth out of her mouth, broke three ribs, uh, broke her nose in several places. Three days later, uh, Graham succumbed to her wounds and, and died. In May 2014, Marianne Mendoza got a call about her son, police officer Brandon Mendoza. Brandon was an incredible human being. He just lit up a room when he would walk in. He was driving home from work and this man was coming the wrong way on that same ramp and hit my son head on. Um, the minute we drove up and I saw all the police cars, I knew it wasn't good, and probably about five or 10 minutes after me arriving there, my son passed away. I started Googling this man's name who killed my son, and he had been convicted of crimes in 1994 up in Colorado. Um, then they were lenient on him. They dismissed assault, burglary, leaving the scene of an accident. They spent no jail time whatsoever, was just released to go back out and do it again. 
One month after her son was killed by an illegal felon, she wrote President Obama a letter. President Obama, as a tax-paying, law-abiding citizen of the United States, I want my voice heard on this issue. I'm furious that the federal government allowed this criminal to stay in this country and kill my son. He was an icon with the city of Mesa Police Department. He was instrumental. I'm doing this for his honor because he would have done this for somebody else had it happened to them. And I'm not going to allow it to be another statistic. He was too important to too many people. The silence from Washington in answer to her concerns speaks volumes. No one is exempt from this kind of violence by illegal immigrants. Thank goodness there are some people who will never let us forget about those who have been victims of crimes committed by illegal immigrants. Maria Espinoza is the director of the Remembrance Project. Her organization honors and remembers Americans who have been killed by illegal immigrants. The Stolen Lives Quilt is a visual memorial for the victims. It also helps raise awareness about what is taking place and how egregiously our legal citizens are being treated. It's a powerful reminder about how our fellow citizens could have been protected, but were not. It is, you know, all Americans, black, white, rich, poor, mom, dad, a five-year-old, two-month-old baby. It's not discriminating. There is a huge price to be paid for us not enforcing the law. When the law enforcement encounters someone who's unlawfully present in America and they simply turn them loose or they turn a blind eye and decide that they're not going to process the law against them, and that individual goes along and commits, um, it could be negligent homicide, vehicular homicide, could be manslaughter, second degree, first degree murder, uh, then there's an American that goes to their grave. And we don't see that somehow as the price for not enforcing the law, but it is. Obama was speaking in Texas. You know, as I listened to the newscast and realized he refused to go down to the border, it made me mad thinking he's just not in touch with reality. And unless he goes down there and sees this with his own eyes and sees the grief and sees the hurt that this sort of problem has caused individuals, he, he has no clue what this is all about. The presidential oath of office says the president will preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution states, The United States shall guarantee to every state in the Union a Republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion and against domestic violence. If the president of the United States can be disrespectful for, for the law, why should not some illegal alien crossing the border? There are dozens of immigration laws on the books already that are not being enforced or implemented by the Obama administration. The Secure Fence Act of 2006 required 700 miles of double layer fencing along the southwest border. It passed overwhelmingly in the Senate, 80 to 19, including with the support of then Senators Obama and Biden. According to U.S. Customs and Border Protection, only 36.3 of the 700 miles of double layer fencing have been constructed on the southwest border to date. Eight laws have been passed requiring a biometric system to track when and whether a foreign visitor with a temporary visa leaves this country. 40% of illegal immigrants have overstayed their visas. Now you've seen how the lack of enforcement of even our current laws has allowed illegal immigrants to bring violence into our country. Unfortunately, that's only the tip of the iceberg. One thing that people don't think about when they're Looking at the surge of all these people coming up, those children are going to have food stamp benefits, Medicare, Medicaid expenses. You're going to have school expenses, and since they, have, they don't know English, you're going to have non-English teaching expenses. That's straining your educational system. That's straining your defense, attorneys. That's straining your public schools. That's straining just about everything you possibly think of. You have more people going on welfare. You have more people needing assistance. When you bring in massive numbers of people and you put them on welfare, that means that national debt continues to go up. More people are dependent upon government than are contributors to government. The president has put us in a power dive into the third world. You know, the government data shows that since the year 2000, all of the growth and jobs in this country have gone to foreign born. Millions more Americans have turned 18, have been added to the workforce. There's not been one extra job for Americans since the year 2000. We don't have a shortage of workers, we have a surplus of workers. We have a shortage of jobs. 
It's not in the national interest to uh, bring in huge numbers of, of uh, workers at a time when wages are falling and jobs are hard to get. And Peter Kersenow, who's a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, he has made clear in repeated articles that immigration, as they are planning and they have proposed, will hurt African Americans the most. Illegal immigration has a disproportionately negative effect on the employment and wage levels of low-skilled Americans, specifically black Americans. So the last thing we should be doing is doubling the number of people coming into the country to take jobs, allowing us our lawful system of immigration to collapse. The rule of law coincides with being a humanitarian, but understand that the humanitarian instincts have to care for Americans first. We can't take care of our own people if we keep on driving down the wages and displacing American workers. It is intentionally turning America into a third world country. And you look at other things that are happening in the, in the political element, like health care, the control of our public lands, interference with enforcing the immigration laws. It is done in violation of law. That's turning America into a lawless country. And since we're a country of laws, that is turning us into a failed state. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the ways an open border will fundamentally and negatively transform our country. What incubates at the border, the crime, the economic hardships, the wanton disregard for the law, even diseases, are being imported and spread to every state, every county, and every town in America. These immigrants are being brought everywhere into the country, Georgia, Maryland, California, up to Maine. And everybody that they're coming in contact with potentially could be affected. There was a story from Maryland how parents got letters sent home from their school saying that their child had been exposed to an illegal, illegal immigrant child who had tuberculosis. That's going to be repeated. So this is not something that people should think of as being, oh, it's just happening in Texas. It doesn't affect me. And everybody is just being put at risk. A country's borders are its first and last line of defense. First and last line of defense against aliens um, who are involved with criminal activity, terrorism activity, also people with dangerous diseases. The impact is nationally the cost to our communities is national. The cost to the economy is national. In law enforcement, especially along the border, we've seen a lot of these things happening, and the trend is moving inward into the, into the uh, inner part of the, the country. When we see those kinds of things happening here, there's no reason to believe they're not going to happen elsewhere, and those things are moving uh, further into the uh, communities and our inner cities and everything else. And the things that we've dealt with here for years, it's definitely going to become worse. Either we come to the conclusion that America's national security is the priority, or we will face dire consequences. On 9-11, when that attack took place, and the ashes landed on my home, and my neighbors came out crying, this gets me to this day. Because they didn't know where their wives or their children or their parents were, and they never saw them again. I knew in my heart that I had testified before Congress four and a half damn years earlier, and they did not listen. And here we are being warned about ISIS, being warned that there's a clear and present immediate danger. Politicians from both sides of the aisle telling us that the solution to massive illegal immigration is to provide lawful status and identity documents to people who snuck into the country, whose true identities can't be determined. What could possibly go wrong? You've taken an oath to defend the country, defend the Constitution, and defend Americans. Because illegal activity is condoned, outlaws are not punished, our border is wide open, our identity is disappearing, our national autonomy has disappeared. A nation without borders is not a nation. And that's what we're becoming here on our southern border. Everybody needs to take it seriously. We know because we've been here on the front lines for lots of years. But we are here to tell you that live in middle America, it is coming to you. And until it affects your children, and when it does, it might be too late. So you'd better wake up right now because this is an issue that is not going to go away.
Washington's promise to illegal immigrants is a life in America without consequences. And that's simply not the truth. What we are seeing on our border today is neither moral nor compassionate. It is neither moral nor compassionate to encourage parents to send their children off to embark on a life or death trek with an uncertain future. It is neither moral nor compassionate to put children at risk of bodily injury, disease, or possibly even worse, life as a gang slave. It is neither moral nor compassionate to put our own hardworking American families at such risk. This young Honduran woman was brought to the border by a human smuggler. She couldn't keep up with the others, abused by the environment, ripped by the mesquite, and dehydrated. So she was simply left to die. Fortunately, she was rescued in time. Can we say the same for America? There is no place on earth like America. My father came here, you know, 60 years ago, started from nothing, had his child go to Princeton, become a doctor, and I'm sitting here talking to you. And it couldn't happen anywhere else. And I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. And if we let this slip away, then we're going to regret it. When I got here in America, I had $75 in my pocket. Now I have a house, I have a very good life. And I always, always thank Americans to give me that opportunity. We are generous on immigration. We allow a million a year to come lawfully. Plus another 600,000 guest workers are here. Uh, that's a generous policy. We don't need to apologize for it. So this is a generous nation with regard to immigration and that vitality of good immigration has always been a positive for America. It's our strength as a people. We just don't do anybody a favor. It's not compassionate to bring in millions of people, millions uh, who don't have work to do, are going to struggle to get by and not live a healthy life. America has always been a beacon for those that want a better life, and it still is today. There is already a legal path to citizenship for those wishing to immigrate to the United States. Anyone who decided to get off that path and enter the United States illegally should not be given any sort of amnesty. That is neither fair nor equal treatment under the law. There are people who have stood in line, who have done everything that was requested of them to come to this country legally. I don't understand why we would have rules in this country if we're not gonna enforce them. We've lacked the will. We always get close to taking the final step, but we never take the final step that closes the loop, that ensures uh, accountability and enforceability. We have to enforce the laws that are on the books. We have to allow the people who are responsible for immigration, Border Patrol, ICE, HSI, those organizations have to be able to do their job in accordance with the law and not just political policy. If you're really serious about, about shutting down the border, then fund local law enforcement. Local law enforcement knows who's involved. Local law enforcement knows the area. If we enforce the laws that we had, if we did 100% detention, 100% removal, this would stop, and, and we know it would stop because we've had this in the past. In 2006, we were getting hit with record numbers of uh, people coming in from countries other than Mexico, and we were apprehending them, we were releasing them on their own recognizance, never to come back. And then we put into uh, what was ca called an expedited removal, where it was 100% detention, 100% removal. Literally in three days, it dried up. Once word got back to the home country that we're not gonna release you, it, it just, it was like turning off a faucet. People just stopped coming. It starts with our borders, it continues with interior enforcement, and it's about sending a very clear message to people around the world. We are a country of laws. We are serious about our laws, and there will be consequences for those people who don't abide by those laws. It's not about being left or right, but about being right or wrong. We've been there when the Republicans had control of the White House. We've been there when the Democrats have had control of the White House, and nothing has changed to help us on the border. This is not a red issue. 
and it's not a blue issue. It's a red, white, and blue issue. America is facing serious problems. Our families are facing serious problems. It's not going to be fixed unless we force the issue. It's up for us to find our voices and use them. The fundamental question, do you stand with America? Do you stand with Americans? It's really very simple. Millions of people immigrate to America because they believe we have something that their home countries do not. Freedom, equality, and security. But the brutal truth is, that's all slipping away. We increasingly inhabit a world in which America does not protect its citizens' lives and property from invasion and destruction, where the president makes up his own rules and laws without going through Congress, and where the government ceases to apply the laws equally and without bias. And that's a very scary world. Just ask the ranchers that are living this reality today. However, with your help, we can ensure that America lives up to its promise. Whether you are native born or a legal immigrant, you will be secure in the knowledge that our borders are protected, our laws are enforced, and freedom is cherished. It is critical that all of us pick up the phone as soon as possible and call our representative and our senators and tell them to secure the border, enforce our laws, and oppose amnesty for illegal immigrants. Help us keep the momentum going in the right direction by going to borderstatesofamerica.com where you'll find more actions that you can take today. It's going to take all of us making an effort together to get this done. This is the best country in the world. Let's keep it that way. For you, for your children and your grandchildren and future legal immigrants, all of whom hope to achieve their American dream. I'm Nick Searcy. Thanks for joining me.